Chapter 3 of The Pirate and the Three Cutters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leon Andrews. The Pirate and the Three Cutters by Frederick Marriott. The Gale. Those who, standing on the pier, have witnessed the proud bearing of the Circassian as she gave her canvas to the winds, little contemplated her fate still less did those on board for confidence is the characteristic of seamen and they have the happy talent of imparting their confidence to whomsoever may be in their company we shall pass over the voyage confining ourselves to a description of the catastrophe it was during a gale from the northwest which had continued for three days and by which the circassian had been driven into the bay of biscay that at about twelve o'clock at night a slight lull was perceptible the captain who had remained on deck sent down for the chief mate oswald said captain ingram the gale is breaking and i think before morning we shall have had the worst of it i shall lie down for an hour or two call me if there be any change oswald barrett a tall sinewy built and handsome specimen of transatlantic growth examined the whole circumference of the horizon before he replied at last his eyes were steadily fixed to leeward i've a notion not sir said he i see no signs of clearing off to leeward only a lull for relief and a fresh hand at the bellows depend upon it we have now had it three days replied captain ingram and that's the life of a summer gale yes rejoined the mate but always provided that it don't blow back again i don't like the look of it sir and have it back we shall as sure as there's snakes in virginity well so be if so be was the safe reply of the captain you must keep a sharp lookout barreth and don't leave the deck to call me send a hand down the captain descended to his cabin Oswald looked at the compass in the binnacle, spoke a few words to the man at the helm, gave one or two terrible kicks in the ribs to some of the men who were culking, sounded the pump well, put a fresh quid of tobacco into his cheek, and then proceeded to examine the heavens above. A cloud, much darker and more descending than the others, which obscured the ferrament, spread over the zenith, and based itself upon the horizon to leeward. Oswald's eye had been fixed upon it but a few seconds, when he beheld a small lambent gleam of lightning pierce through the most opaque part, then another, and more vivid. Of a sudden the wind lulled, and the Circassian righted from her careen. Again the wind howled, and again the vessel was pressed down to her bearings by its force. Again another flash of lightning, which was followed by a distant peal of thunder. Had the worst of it! did you say captain i've a notion that the worst is yet to come muttered oswald still watching the heavens how does she carry her helm matthew inquired oswald walking aft spoke of weather i'll have that try sail off of her at any rate continued the mate aft there my lads and lower down the try sail keep the sheet fast till it's down or the flogging will frighten the lady passenger out of her wits well if ever i own a craft i'll have no women aboard dollars shan't tempt me the lightning now played in rapid forks and the loud thunder which instantaneously followed each flash proved its near approach a deluge of slanting rain descended the wind lulled roared again then lulled shifted a point or two and the drenched and heavy sails flapped up with the helm mat cried Oswald, as a flash of lightning for a moment blinded, and the accompanying peal of thunder deafened those on deck. Again the wind blew strong, it ceased, and it was a dead calm. The sails hung down from the yards, and the rain descended in perpendicular torrents, while the ship rocked to and fro in the trough of the sea, and the darkness became suddenly intense. "'Down, there, one of you, and call the captain,' said Oswald. "'By the Lord!' We shall have it. Main braces there. Men, and square the yards. Be smart. That topsail should have been in, muttered the mate. But I'm not, Captain. Square away the yards, my lad, continued he. Quick, quick, 
There's no child's play here! Owing to the difficulty of finding and passing the ropes to each other, from the intensity of the darkness and the deluge of rain which blinded them, the men were not able to execute the order of the mates so soon as it was necessary. And before they could accomplish their task, or Captain Ingram could gain the deck, the wind suddenly burst upon the devoted vessel from the quarter directly opposite to that from which the gale had blown, taking her all aback and throwing her on her beam ends. The man at the helm was hurled over the wheel, while the rest who were with Oswald at the main bits, with the coils of rope and every other article on deck not secured, were rolled into the scuffers, struggling to extricate themselves from the mass of confusion and the water in which they floundered. The sudden revulsion awoke all the men below, who imagined that the ship was foundering, and, from the only hatchway not secured, they poured up in their shirts with their other garments in their hands to put them on, if fate permitted. Oswald Barev was the first who clambered up from to leeward. He gained the helm, which he put hard up. Captain Ingram and some of the seamen also gained the helm. It is the rendezvous of all good seamen in emergencies of this description. But the howling of the gale, the blinding of the rain and salt spray, the seas checked in their running by shifts of wind and breaking over the ship in vast masses of water, the tremendous peals of thunder, and the intense darkness which accompanied these horrors added to the inclined position of the vessel which obliged them to climb from one part of the deck to another for some time checked all profitable communication their only friend in this conflict of the elements was the lightning unhappy indeed the situation in which lightning can be welcomed as a friend but its vivid and forked flames darting down upon every quarter of the horizon enabled them to perceive their situation and awful as it was when momentarily presented to their sight it was not so awful as darkness and uncertainty to those who have been accustomed to the difficulties and dangers of a seafaring life there are no lines which speak more forcibly to the imagination or prove the beauty and power of the greek poet than those in the noble prayer of Ajax. Lord of earth and air, O King, O Father, hear my humble prayer. Dispel this cloud, the light of heaven restore. Give me to see, and Ajax ask no more. If Greece must perish, we thy will obey, but let us perish in the face of the day. Also gave the helm to two of the seamen, and with his knife cut adrift the axes, which were lashed round the mizzenmast in painted canvas covers. One he restrained for himself, the others he put into the hands of the boatswain and the second mate. To speak so as to be heard was almost impossible from the tremendous roaring of the wind, but the lamp still burned in the binnacle, and by its feeble light Captain Ingram could distinguish the signs made by the mate and could give his consent. It was necessary that the ship should be put before the wind, and the helm had no power over her. In a short time the lanyards of the mizzen rigging were severed, and the mizzen mast went over the side, almost unperceived by the crew on the other parts of the deck, or even those near, had it not been from blows received by those who were too close to it, from the falling of the topsail sheets and the rigging about the mast. Oswald with his companions, regained the binnacle, and for a little while watched the compass. The ship did not pay off, and appeared to settle down more into the water. Again Oswald made his signs, and again the captain gave his assent. Forward sprang the undaunted mate, clinging to the bulwark, and belaying pins, and followed by his hardy companions until they had all three gained the main channels. Here, their exposure to the force of the breaking waves and the stoutness of the ropes yielding, but slowly to the blows of the axes, which were used almost under water, rendered the service one of extreme difficulty and danger. The boatswain was washed over the bulwark and dashed to leeward, where the lee rigging only saved him from a watery grave. Unsubdued, um, he again climbed up to windward, rejoined and assisted his companions. The last blow was given by Oswald. The lanyards flew through the dead eyes, and the tall masts disappeared in the foaming seas. 
Oswald and his companions hastened from their dangerous position and rejoined the captain, who, with many of the crew, still remained near the wheel. The ship now slowly paid off and righted. In a few minutes, she was flying before the gale, rolling heavily, and occasionally striking upon the wrecks of the mast, which she towed with her by the lee rigging. Although the wind blew with as much violence as before, still it was not with the same noise. Now that the ship was before the wind with her aftermast gone the next servant was to clear the ship of the wrecks of the mast but although all now assisted but little could be effected until the day had dawned and even then it was a service of danger as the ship rolled gunwale under those who performed the duty were slung in ropes that they might not be washed away and hardly was it completed when a heavy roll assisted by a jerking heave from a sea which struck her on the chest tree, sent the foremast over the starboard cathead. Thus was the Circassian dismasted in the gale. End of chapter 3